we are grateful to have you all gathered together today. Um, for those who uh, have yet to go to uh, the second service, uh, today's scripture, featured scripture passage from our narrative lectionary is um, Jesus uh, sharing yet another parable. Uh, this time it's the parable of, uh, commonly referred to as the, the parable of rich man and Lazarus. And, uh, um, and, and what the rich man's experience is um, just before and just after he dies. And so uh, that, um, that context inspired us to think about um, what is it that we do in life that prepares us for death and, uh, and uh, things around that. And it just happens that in my world, uh, I uh, uh, happen to know someone who spends a lot of time getting people prepared uh, just before and just after their death. And so uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be able to share uh, uh, um, and have invited, and she was willing to do it, that uh, my wife, Anne, would be really willing to join us today and talk a little bit about her professional experiences as a funeral director, and in particular, thinking about uh, the ways in which uh, and the preparation and the and the awareness that we can have um, prior to uh, times of death, how much that um, preparatory work uh, can can offer actually life giving opportunity for people, uh, even in the saddest of times. Um, and uh, and so um, so we've we're we're lucky to have uh, Anne here. She's in a different room in the house, so we don't have to hear each other <laughs> talk in that way and and struggle with sound and that kind of stuff. And um, and uh, that's all I need to do. I'm I know Anne's got some uh, things prepared to share with us. I'll moderate. If you have questions, just raise your hand. Um, and uh, we'll find an appropriate moment to, to ask them. You can also put your questions in the chat, which is a great way to um, kind of get in the queue uh, to talk about that. And uh, we're going to have a little opportunity for some, some back and forth, and, and uh, we'll take it from there. So great to have you with us. And take it away. You're muted. Step one. <laughs> Sorry. It's been a little while. Um, I'm used to meeting even during this last year of pandemic, uh, meeting with a lot of people face to face whenever possible. And so um, the Zoom uh, uh, smart point there for me. Um, and also because of that, I'm gonna depend on Peter to do a lot of the um, paying attention to what happens on the larger screen. and. So when you have a question to ask, um, please just uh, indicate to him that you would like to have that answered and he'll let me know what, uh, what it is we should talk about. Most of this uh, that I'm gonna talk about today, I'm used to having in dialogue and conversation. So I'm gonna try to keep it as linear as I can, but um, I tend to go in a really circuitous pattern because I think when I'm talking with people, their questions arise um, at different times and, uh, and so we just kind of go down that path and answer that question before we get back to a uh, sort of a main track. Um, so I'll try to keep it uh, as linear as I can and sequential, but um, but know that you can pop up and ask a question anytime to uh, to have some clarification. Um, I'm just a quick introduction about me, and I know that some of you have heard me talk about funeral service before and about my part in it, um, but many of you have not. So. Um, it's a relatively new vocation for me. Um, I, I think for some time I've thought about the fact that I feel like I, I could be good at comforting people who are in sorrow and sadness. Um, and that was my primary motivation to, to seek out something in this line of work. Uh, there was a time probably, oh, 12, 15 years ago that I thought maybe I'd pursue either funeral service or hospice care as a, as a career as our kids got older. Um, and quite honestly led my, uh, followed that path into funeral service because it seemed like a little, um, like fewer barriers to get to that point, to get licensed and that sort of thing. So while, while Peter was in seminary at Luther here, I started, uh, started my educational path to get licensed as a funeral director. So, um, so really I've been working as a licensed director for only five years. Um, and so, uh, all of our previous uh, work together in the restaurant business and my work with uh, 
kids in an after school program and recreation, this just is an extension of that kind of hospitality for me. Um, like I said, I, I began this work because I thought it was something that I could, that, that comforting people was something that I could do well. And um, it turns out I do a lot of educating of people. A lot of people don't know what their options are or about all the decisions that need to be made uh, once a death occurs. And, um, and it turns out that sometimes the most comforting thing I can offer is being the person that knows what to do next. Um, and, and even experienced this recently in my own family. So many of you know that my dad just died at the end of January. And I remember lots of conversation with my mom in that, in that final week with him where I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do to wait. Waiting is, is you know, just, just this time of, of peace and comfort and goodness and reflection, but, but I didn't really know what steps to take. I knew exactly what to do when my dad died. And, and my mom said, well, that's okay. I know, what, I know what the waiting is like. I can do that part. You help me with the part that comes after. So we were a good team that way. Um, so, so what do I do when I die? <laughs> and and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use the word you a lot as I talk. Um, I'm not saying that, that what do you do when you die, but what do you do for your loved ones? What do you do for the people in your life that um, as you approach, uh, you know, considering this. Um, I come from a time when, uh, you know, when we were getting ready to have kids that there was, it was a big deal to have a birthing plan to talk about how you wanted that to go. Did you want to labor at home a long time? Did you want to have your baby at home? When did you want to go to the hospital? What kind of, you know, did you want to take drugs? Did you want to stay in the hospital for a long time? All of those things. And I think that all of those decisions can apply to our end of life decisions as well. Um, for a long time, societally, it's been uncomfortable to have those uh, discussions because we don't want to acknowledge that we're going to die. Nobody does. Um, but I think the sooner that you can do it, the better, partly because when it's not, when it doesn't feel imminent, it's easier to have that conversation. I know my kids have grown up hearing uh, me talk about how uh, you know, what funeral hymns I want to have at my funeral. And this is before I even thought I would be a funeral director. And we kind of joke about it, but, but also like, I'm kind of comforted to know that when, when the time comes, they'll know that we're going to sing praise to the Lord, the almighty at my funeral, because that's just been part of the conversation for a long time. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think I'll kind of try to reiterate over and over again today, just how important it is to let to have some idea of what you would like to have happen and, and also to let people know about it. Um, so I think probably it makes most sense to go from, um, you know, what do I do when someone dies? And I think um, it, in, in that moment, you know, you may have time to prepare for it and you may not. And there's sort of two different um, uh, plans that you have at that point. And so, uh, generally when you're going to enter long-term care or hospice, or even when you get admitted to the hospital with a serious illness, the people that are helping you into that transition, your hospice provider, the intake people, the social worker at the nursing home and whatnot, they will want to know which funeral home you want to choose when you, when you pass. You don't have to have a funeral home. Um, but like I said, I think a comforting thing is, uh, is to have somebody who knows what what the steps are to help guide you through that, that, that can be a very comforting thing. So um, if you choose not to have a funeral home, you don't have to have a funeral director to do all these things for you, but you should do some homework for sure ahead of time to do that. Um, as far as learning the legalities of who can take care of transportation of your loved one and who can take, you know, drive them to the crematory and file a permit for uh, what's called a disposition permit or a death permit. Um, and so, you know, all of those things we do every day. And so we know how to do it and can do, uh, can sort of meet your needs, whatever they are. Um, so, like I said, as you're entering that transitional care, you'll need to talk about where, who, who should be called when you die. Um, and then say, say you die suddenly at home and there hasn't been a plan put in place like that. The very first call is to 911. Um, I'm not allowed to come to your home to bring the body from your home to into my care unless uh, that's been cleared through the medical examiner. And, and in the case where it hasn't been 
um, registered ahead of time through hospice or long-term care, then the police have to do that. So in Ramsey County, the police or the sheriff's deputy will come to the house and um, and determine whether or not they think there needs to be further investigation. Sometimes there does. Generally, if you're a young person or you die unexpectedly, they're going to want to know why you died. So you're probably going to go to the medical examiner before you come to me. But if it appears to be uh, natural causes, if you have a long-term history with diabetes or something like that, the, the officer on the scene might just say, yeah, it's okay to call the funeral home. You can go straight there. And so we'll get a call from the police department and then, uh, and then contact you, talk to you at the family, just to make sure you're ready for us to come. Um, and I, and I think too, um, you know, yes, your first call is to your hospice provider or to the funeral home or to the law enforcement. Those three things are sort of your main options, but I think top on that too, should be to call your pastor. Um, I, I, very frequently, I think it used to be common for pastors to be, um, at the home when somebody died and they might be the ones who contacted the funeral home. I don't see that very often anymore, but I would hope that, that you all feel, um, comfortable calling your pastor to come and be with you in that time. It's, it's uncertain. And just even having the calming presence of somebody to lead you in prayer could be a really, um, helpful thing. Um, the, I think one of the sort of tricky things to help people navigate is that, um, you know, once that death occurs, it's not really an emergency right now. I mean, we can, we can sort of step back and, and slow down a little bit. I think the inclination is to start making phone calls and get things in motion and go, 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 go. And, um, and sometimes you just need a second to, to absorb what's going on. And so the first thing that happens when I receive a call that someone has died um, it's probably from a hospice nurse. I will turn back around and call the family and ask if they're ready for me to come. You might, uh, you know, your loved one is at home with you and has been dying and you've been involved in their care for a number of weeks and you might not be ready to let go just yet. And you might want other family members to come to the house and be with you. So you're not alone when I get there. And I think, um, that's, that's an important thing to recognize that you have autonomy, you have decision-making power and you have the right to sort of declare the timeline. So sometimes people cannot get this body out of the house fast enough. And so we, I try to be there within the hour. That's, that's our kind of policy. And for, probably for most funeral homes that will, will come to the house or, or wherever within the hour, um, if that's what you want. But more and more, we see families that just need a little time to absorb that idea. And so it might be, you know, they might ask us to come the next morning or a couple hours from now or whatever it is. And so know that you can have that time to do that. Um, it's, it's a, I'm not, I don't know how much you want to hear about just sort of the, the, the technicalities of the process, but I'll just kind of gloss over the main points of things. Um, I, when I talk about this with people in other presentations, a, one of the top questions I hear about is, well, what happens when I, if I'm alone and I don't have somebody living in my house with me and what happens when, if I die then? Um, I think it's important again, and, and maybe especially because you know that you'll, you live alone and you're, you don't have someone in your house every day to, to be connected to community, whether it's your church or whether it's your kids who live somewhere else or even a neighbor. Um, I've got, I've heard lots of stories about, um, about people where they have a, kind of a signal with the neighbor, the neighbor will be looking. And if your curtain doesn't get opened at the, every morning or if the light doesn't go off at the end of the day, that those neighbors know to look and to come and check on you uh, if, if those things aren't moving, if it looks like there's not activity. So um, not a bad idea to communicate with your neighbors about um, you know, just back and forth. And you can do that for each other, you know, check in, make a phone call, put somebody on your list of people that you check in on. And maybe it's a formal agreement to say, yep, I, I know that this could happen. So please, you know, if you see no, no activity at my house, come on over and take a look, you know, to see if I'm doing okay. Um, if that's the case, then also those people that you've been in contact about that with should also know, um, what your plans are. You should make those plans ahead of time and have a file that has, you know, funeral written on it in big letters or something like that so that it's, it's obvious what that is. Um, 
you can you can plan everything ahead of time. You can plan nothing ahead of time. Um, I, I, myself, I say that, um, you know, on the one hand, I think, well, it'll really be up to my kids to know what to do with me. But um, many kids are comforted by the knowledge that they're doing what their parent wanted for them. And so if you have it written out ahead of time, it doesn't have to be exactly that way. And obviously we found this year in COVID that it hasn't been exactly that way because of the way we've been limited in gathering. Um, but, but knowing that you're honoring your parent by following their wishes is a pretty uh, comforting thing. Um, and I think too, um, you know, Pastor Ruth, I believe, as I think I've heard this, is working on or has sort of a funeral planning guide for church. Um, you know, you, you, I think it's going to be available online soon. Um, maybe somebody can Ruth, tell go me ahead. if I'm right or wrong. Or wrong. Yeah, there's a good opportunity for you to jump in right there. Yeah. So if you look at our website, um, at the top, on the top bar under participate, there's a tab that says life moments. There is a whole funeral pre-planning section there and fill that out to the degree that you want. As Anne said, you can plan out everything or nothing. I fall into the please don't plan nothing camp, at least that's not <laughs> just because that helps a little bit. Um, but if you go to the website and look at that, it looks at parts of the service, but also some reflection questions that might be helpful for you. And also the information, if you have a plot somewhere um, if you know, again, what funeral home you want to use, all of those things are in that right on the website now. It used to be in a blue folder, but now that we haven't been in person, it's on the website. So go ahead and take a look at that. And if you have questions, you can ask any of us. And yes, we do have hard copies right there at the church. You can stop by and, and Kristen can grab you a, a folder at, uh, at the church as well. So and, and if you fill some of those out, please let somebody know that you've done that. And if it isn't somebody in your family or that it's accessible, that people know that you've done it, we can keep a copy at church. That's a great place to have, um, to say, I've, I've worked out some of the things that I know that I want and here, keep it at church and that's in a safe spot. So know that we can do that with you too. Thanks, I think that's that's very helpful. I, I do have sometimes, uh, you know, children will call me and we're starting to make some plans for their parents and they say, well, I think they might have something at church and we call the church and lo and behold, there's this whole very rich and full detailed plan. Um, and, and yeah, super helpful and a relief to those people that are left with trying to decide what to do. And um, you just mentioned, yeah, do you want to just mention um, the legalities around who gets to make these decisions uh, after you've died? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next of kin sort of chain of succession. One important thing, and I'll touch on this again later, is that um, many of you will have a power of attorney set up to make decisions um, regarding uh, finances and sort of things. That relationship, a power of attorney doesn't have to be your, your child or your spouse or your next of kin. It can be a family friend, but that relationship ends when the death occurs. And so many people say, well, I'm power of attorney, so I can do this, this, and this. And honestly, you can't. So you might elect one of your kids to be power of attorney in, in making those decisions and communication with nursing homes and that sort of thing. Once you die, then that responsibility for decision-making, say your spouse is deceased, that responsibility for decision-making is shared equally between your kids. Um, and so it's important to clarify that in a couple of different ways. You can have power of attorney, certainly. You can also name someone as executor of your estate. Um, and, and so that person will also then uh, have some decision-making authority. As far as my purposes go, this is the way it would work. It was um, the person who died, the next of kin is their spouse. If the spouse is deceased, then it's living children. Um, this is for an adult. Um, living adult children. If children are minors, then it goes to the person's siblings. Um, let's see, there's so many different permutations. Uh, <laughs> um, if it's, uh, once the children are minors, obviously, then they get a lot of decision-making power. Or, I'm um, sorry, I take that back. If, if a person has died that has minor children, um, their parents 
may be able to, or would be the next ones to make those choices if they are still living. Um, so it, I mean, we'll help you navigate all of that. And, and I'm sure actually that's probably online too, but um, so a deceased person is our sort of central character. Then we've got um, their parents, if they're a minor, if they're, if they're an adult, then it's their children. If the children aren't, my, aren't adults, then it's back to parents if they're living, then siblings, there's a whole web. And then it's also um, gets complicated when there's divorces and remarriages and that sort of thing. But uh, a second spouse takes priority over biological children. Um, yeah, most of these cases, we sort of untangle case by case because uh, everyone's, everyone's different now and we've got these blended families and it's kind of a beautiful thing, but, um, but we can help navigate that and have to take a class to, <laughs> to know the legalities of how that all works. And another um, argument for um, having a plan in place so that it just it reduces the potential for conflict and drama amongst yeah. uh, family members who may not uh, you know be in agreement, but it'd be hard to refute. Oh, but this was you know this is th this was their plan you know to yeah. do this. And and two, um, I think um, you know if there's conflict in your family, generally you know it, but sometimes it comes up surprising. You know it it. It can pop up unexpected in unexpected ways when there's uh, grief involved too, because you're not just grieving the loss of your loved one, but also um, maybe the complexity of a relationship and the disappointments that you had. Um, and so, you know, my job I feel like is to sort of understand all that, but also not to fix it. Um, you know, that's a that's a bigger problem for another day. Um, but also to help just kind of keep everybody focused on the task at hand. You might have this deep running, deep seated conflict with your siblings, but the, the purpose here is to honor your parents. And so let's figure out how to do that and get through this event this week peacefully together. Maybe some healing can be born out of that, but, but my focus is going to be taking care of the deceased and making sure that they're honored in a, in a good and respectful way and, um, and hope hope I can talk you into coming on board with me for that. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, and, and believe me, I, I lose a fair amount of sleep over thinking about how to navigate that with families sometimes. Um, that said, um, let's go back. So here we, he, we went off on the tangent, like I thought we would. Um, so let's see, we talked about having, you know, having a plan, communicating with your neighbors about the fact that you may be alone, when you die. And so letting, letting people around, you know, or have a system of checking in and um, whether that's remotely over by phone or with your neighbors who are in your neighborhood, that's great. But then also the next clue would be to have a file where, where information is kept. You want to have your social security number in that file. Probably not a good idea or not a bad idea now to have um, some passwords uh, on that list too of how to get into your computer and into your banking and all of all those kinds of things if you have a will indicating where it's filed or a copy of it in that folder um, all of those you know the more you can do to put to, together it's you know now 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 we can't ask you where things are and so it's it's good to be organized and have it together if you've been in the military uh, to have your discharge paper because that can uh, would be submitted to qualify you for some burial benefits and and also uh, get you buried at the National Cemetery at Fort Snelling. So those kinds of things. Um, but I think too, the very basics, the very most immediate things are to decide what happens to my body. Um, generally, I find that most people have a have an idea already and they probably have already decided that, they want to be buried or they want to be cremated. And you can do both. You can bury ashes. You can have a funeral with a body in a casket at a, at a service and then have that body cremated and then do whatever you want with it. Uh, scatter to the winds or bury in a cemetery or a lot of times people, you know, keep you, keep them at home on their shelves. But um, there, there's part of Part of after death coming to see me to what we call arrangements it's just the funeral planning conference um, is is navigating those steps and figuring out what is up what is possible for you i hear over and over and over again just throw me in a pine box put me in the ground which is great i think that's fine 
for you. <laughs> but I also think that um, most of us say that because our motivation is that we don't want to be a burden to anyone else. We don't want to make things difficult for anyone. And sometimes that decision makes it more difficult for people, for those that are, are sitting left behind. And so my conversation with people who are sitting in my office at that point, um, who are or her conveying to me what their dad's wishes were that he just wanted to be put in a pine box and put in the ground. I say, well, that's good for him. What works for you? Is it, do, do things feel unfinished if we just complete this burial without any ritual or without any gathering of people without any storytelling time? Um, does that leave you feeling um, a little empty? And oftentimes it does. Um, there's, there are many folks who are committed to honoring that because they know that they feel like um, they do a disservice to their parent by going against their wishes, which is fine. But, um, you know, um, it, I think I've, many of you heard me use this phrase over and over again, but, but what I do is get the dead where they need to go, get the living where they need to be. Um, and that might be, um, you know, the physical work of moving a dead body from the home to the burial or to cremation or or what your choice is, um, but helping you sort of think about what kind of steps need to be taken to, to arrive at a better place emotionally, to where you're feeling more comfortable about um, what has gone on, what, what the future looks like in this new future without this person, um, and, and gathering, I think, you know, the fact that we're all here as part of a faith community, um, there's a, I, I don't want to say that <laughs> that it's better, but it kind of is. I mean, the fact that you have this tradition and ritual and years of, of historical knowledge of how to do this, there's a reason that these rituals have stayed in place for so many years, and it's because it's helpful and comforting, and, um, and we rely on our faith in, in times of sadness and grief like this, and, um, and sometimes, you know, you might be really angry about um, about the way this has happened. You might be angry at God, but there's still this ritual that is kind of a nice bedrock and framework that can help you move through it and then come back around to doing work of grief. I saw a question pop up and I, Peter, do you want to read that to me quick? Sure. Actually, I got yeah. a little, I got a little lineup of questions for you. Okay. Why don't uh, we pause for a second? Let me look at them or tell well, me about I'll, them. I'll read them off to you. That's fine. Okay. Um, the first question um, pretty quickly is, um, do you have uh, does does a, does establishing an executor of an estate require a lawyer or is it just filling out a form or you know uh, what do you know what the process is to declare somebody to be the executive of your estate? I don't think you have to have a lawyer, but it's probably good to have a notarized document. Um, oftentimes, uh, if you do if you participate in uh, filling out a living will or a healthcare directive there's a place there where you can name the person you'd like to have make decisions for you. And for our, for our work and our needs, that will, that will fit the bill. So um, I think the, the benefit of getting a lawyer will be if you anticipate people clamoring for uh, one money, because people will, um, but to just, you know, if there's going to be if you sense there's going to be some discord between your survivors, then yeah, I think getting a lawyer is, is good. Um, but most of the time it'll, it'll suffice to put in your healthcare directive to name who you'd like to have make decisions for you leading up to your death and after your death. And I think that there's a delineation in those documents that gives you a choice to name separate people or, and then, both. and then we've got a couple of questions about sort of, um, um, after death decisions. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I know you probably are prepared to go there as well. So I'll just name the questions and then, um, you can respond to them or, or hold off into, as you want to talk about a couple other things, but one question about the, um, uh, John Sweeney asks, you know, you hear about scattering, um, ashes, uh, um, cremains, uh, cremated remains. Um, are there legal issues around that? And then also, um, Betsy wants you to make sure that you talk about uh, donating organs or donating um, your body to research, um, what options are around that as well. And um, I know you have 
some thoughts on both of those fronts. So I've got soapboxes for both. Yep. No. <laughs> Um, as far as uh, scattering cremated remains, it's becoming increasingly popular, um, just like, well, cremation itself. So right now, cremation itself uh, uh, nationwide is about chosen by about 50% of the population, and that's just on the rise. Um, historically, once a family chooses cremation for one family member, they're probably going to choose it for everyone else after that. Um, I'm okay with that. I think that's great. There are elders in my profession who, um, you know, miss the old ways where it was always the same every time and you did the same thing. And sure, that's fine. And But I think that um, we're changing and we're trying to adapt to what our consumer needs. And that is most of them are going to choose cremation for a number of reasons. And, and the same reason that we're not burying ashes in cemeteries that we're scattering them a lot is the fact that we choose cremation in itself is that we're not, we're kind of mobile now. We don't live in the same area for five generations like we used to. There's not, it's not likely that um, your loved ones are going to come tend to your grave at the cemetery. They will for a generation. Um, you know, my kids might visit my grave wherever it is, but their kids probably won't, um, at least not with any frequency or regularity. Um, and so that's, that's a thing to consider. And then also because we are not as tied to our faith traditions um, nationwide or societally. Um, and, and also the faith traditions are making adaptations and, and changes too. Um, even the Catholic church now has finally uh, said, okay, I guess cremation is okay. They still would like cremated remains to be buried in a cemetery. I think the Pope's statement says something like, um, uh, cremated remains should should all stay together should, shouldn't split them up to to different family members but stay together and be buried in a public cemetery so as not to deny the general public the opportunity to celebrate and mourn the life of this person beautiful words i think it's great um but also it's not not really practical for a lot of people so um as far as the legalities of scattering cremated remains i as a professional am not going to probably uh, want to know what your plans are. <laughs> um, and, and I think I would recommend, I guess, if your plan is to do it in a public place, like a, like a state park or something like that, there, it wouldn't be bad to do some research on, on whether there's a permit available. A lot of times there is. Um, I know a lot of funeral directors will do um, disbursement of cremated remains as a part of their ceremony, but they get a permit to do it. And, um, and, because they're also collecting money to help coordinate it and navigate it for you. Um, you're going to pay for it. If you go and do it on your own, it's fine. Um, but also I would recommend private property to do it on. Um, and, and honestly, it, it has to do with, you know, if there's any identifiable and identi identifiable pieces that will actually be evident that they're bone matter, people might get nervous. You know, if you come across on a trail in a state park and you find a piece of bone and you know it's bone, you're going to wonder why it's there. Um, most of the time, cremated remains are processed down enough that it's not going to be identifiable as bone matter. You can scatter it wherever you want. Just don't tell me about it. Um, that said, and then also I think though too that um, the practicality of it is you wanted to make sure it's a really calm day because I don't know how many stories I've heard about people having things blow back on them and that's kind of gross so um yeah just be be thoughtful and but and, but make a ritual of it too um uh I think you know gather your nearest and dearest to do it and and uh say some words about your loved one that you're setting for the end of the world I think that's that can be a beautiful thing um, my very first sort of funeral that I led was that kind of thing exactly where we um, helped helped my friends who were scattering the ashes of their son in the mountains. And it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. So I would I would recommend it if you're if you're inclined to do that. Um, back to Betsy's question about donation. This is a completely different thing. Um, I hear a lot of folks that talk about wanting people donate their bodies for different reasons, um, but but I think it's important to understand what happens to your body when you donate it, especially if you're living here in the Metro, you're most likely to donate to the University of Minnesota Anatomy Bequest Program, or your choice is to, to go to Life Source or the Lion's Eye Bank. So you can donate eyes, you can donate tissue, bone matter, organs, that sort of thing. So things that it's important to know. If you want to 
donate your body to research and study, uh, say at the university. One is um, you have to be pre-registered. And even when you are pre-registered, it doesn't guarantee that your body will be accepted into the program. Um, before COVID, when they had a full process going on, I think they received about 500 donors a year. And then when the pandemic hit last year, um, they dropped almost to, I, I think I've heard of one. I think I've worked with one family in the last year where that was their plan. Um, so they, you know, when they don't have students on campus, they don't have need for cadavers for study. Some people wanna donate because they feel like the illness or the condition they have is unique and they feel like that would be useful for people to know about. Um, the way you're gonna be most useful if you have a rare condition or disease is if you participate in studies before you die. Um, once, once you die and you donate your body, you don't really get to say what happens to it. Um, and so if you're at all squeamish about what happens to your body, then, then maybe donation isn't right for you. I will say as a, as a beneficiary of that, that's how I learned to embalm in school. It was from people who donated their bodies to the university, but the dental school uses cadavers, the, um, obviously the physiology and anatomy departments, the medical school, nursing students, they all, they all get to use cadavers um, that are donated to the U. And then the U also um, has a program where they uh, send people out or, or send their donors' bodies out uh, to other educational programs within the state. So you might end up in Duluth or you might end up uh, in Morris or you know, at, at another school. Um, and, and typically what happens is the cadaver is used for about 12 to 18 months for study. So it's very, very, uh, very preserved. And then different parts can be used in different ways. Um, everything's um, joined together at the end. You might, but you might be in a couple of different locations, um, but you join together at the end and cremated and then your cremated remains are returned to your family after that amount of time. Um, I will sometimes meet with a family. We might have a memorial service or a gathering right after the death has occurred. I think sooner the better, um, even though that body isn't there, knowing that they'll have them return to them afterwards. Um, one of the great things about the university program is that there's no cost to you. So if you donate, you know they're gonna take care of cremation for you for no cost. But um, the other thing is that when people wanna donate organs, um, you have to, die or be removed from life support in order for your organs to be viable for donation. So if you die unexpectedly at home, your heart is probably not going to be able to be transplanted because the second life stops, decomposition begins and cells start to die. And so then that makes it not viable for transfer. Not necessarily the case with eyes. You can donate your eyes and you can donate bones and tissue, skin, um, after death. Um, in fact, you can donate eyes for up to, I think it's maybe 24 hours after death. So depending on age and um, your health and, and there are medical professionals and organizations that take care of all of that, but always to you, the donor, there is no cost. Um, your insurance company pays for it, but there's no cost to you. So, um, so I think um, always it's, a, it's an important gift to consider. Uh, there are many, many people who can be helped by any part of your body that you're willing to donate. So. Um, absolutely make that part, make that known to people beyond just on your driver's license, um, you know, have that discussion. It, it is a area where some people get a little squeamish or whatever. And I think also people um, are under the assumption that if they donate any part of their body, they can't have an open casket or they can't have a funeral where people will see that body and it, you can. Um, we work, there's plenty of formal, former funeral directors that work for those donor agencies and um, they know what we need to make it work for you. And so um, there's good teamwork in that, in that process. Um, and also, I mean, I think it helps, you know, I don't know, I think it's comforting for those who are surviving, those who donated because they're, I just talked to a woman the other day, she was so grateful that her husband, because he had been a kidney recipient, um, you often aren't able to donate an organ once you have received one um, because you have probably other, other health conditions that would prevent you from, from that. But this woman, her husband had died um, with having received a kidney, but his liver was viable to be donated to someone else. And so she was just thrilled to know that, um, that they were kind of sharing that legacy and spreading that to it for another family.
um, yeah, so um, does that answer those questions? Thanks. Um, I think another part to move on to now would be um, to talk about uh, the financial part of it because that's a pretty real, um, a pretty real, uh, it's a reality that people have to face and, and probably don't think about a lot. And because it is expensive um, and by and large a casket funeral and a burial, once you have cemetery plot purchased and everything and all those expenses, it's going to be um, about three times more than the cost of cremation, which is another reason cremation is becoming more popular. Um, and so um, just like I talked before about power of attorney being a thing that ends at death. Um, also, if there's nobody that has signature authority on your bank account, that gets closed too once a death certificate is filed until, um, until a death certificate is received, until things start moving through a legal chain of, of um, a, through a legal list of things that need to occur. And so you might not have access or your kids might not have access to your accounts um, and they'll be expected to pay for things at the funeral home kind of right away. So um, there are things that you can do to prepare for that. Um, one is you could make your, your next of kin or your kids signature signatories on your accounts. You can put your money into a trust that they also um, you know, have access to and can sign for. That's probably the easiest thing. Um, you can use life insurance policies to help pay for funeral expenses, but most funeral homes are gonna use um, an assignment company, a company that does that processing work for them. And so there'll be a service fee on that. Um, for us, the company that we use charges about 4%. So um, it, there's, for some people that 4% is worth, um, you know, the convenience is worth the expense, but others find that they'd rather not do that. So then you end up putting a funeral expense on your credit card and wait for the insurance to come and pay you back in a month. Um, if you don't have insurance, um, well, we're gonna come to that in just a minute. The other thing that you can do is you can put your money into a policy that's designated specifically for funeral expenses. And so I don't have the, I don't have the license to do that. It's a special insurance license that you need to have. Um, we've got staff people that do that. And there's lots of people out there that are selling these kinds of policies um, that can walk you through exactly what you need to do. You can spell out exactly what the money is for, um, you know, for which urn, which flowers you want to do, you can be as detailed or not as you want. Um, I sort of tend to, if it's a funeral policy you're buying, this is the reason to do it. One is um, it's transferable. You, you might have gone to O'Haller and Murphy for four generations in your family, and that's great. But if they close their doors tomorrow, you don't want to have lost that money. Legally, a funeral home can't keep your money themselves for more than 14 days. So it needs to go into this trust or this policy that protects you as the consumer. And so you are going to, one, be able to use that policy wherever you want. So one, the funeral home goes out of business or two, you move to Arizona, you can use it there with whatever funeral home will accept it. Um, when you purchase it uh, through, a, through a funeral home and it's designated for funeral expenses, one, it guarantees that you are, your kids are gonna follow the plan that you made. So if you plan for burial and, and you say, okay, this money is set aside for embalming and a casket and all these things, they're more likely to stay on that track if, if you've already designated and put the funding towards it. Um, the other thing then is uh, it guarantees the prices that we're charging at the time that, we're, that you're purchasing it. So if you, if you bought it 10 years ago and then you need it in five years, Obviously, our costs have, are going to have increased by then, but you'll still be paying. You won't have to pay more than what those costs were 10 years ago when you bought it. Um, the other thing, too, I guess, is that um, many folks will use this tool as you're entering long-term care, especially if there's an expectation that you're going to outlive your assets. Um, so you may spend down your assets so you can get Medicaid to, to help cover your nursing home care. And so one of the allowable ways to protect some of your assets is to put it in a funeral policy <clears throat> and, and you can designate exactly what kind of funeral you wanna have and, and put it aside and you can, you can legally keep that as an asset as you're entering long-term care. So that's, that's another good reason to have it. Um, I was gonna go somewhere else with that and now I've lost my train of thought. So 
Is there another question I can answer? Um, uh, John Sweeney just asked for the benefit, everybody, if this presentation is going to be uh, recorded uh, and would be something that could be shared with his children. And yes, <laughs> this is being yeah. recorded and um, and we'll have it posted on our uh, website later this week. And if you're struggling to find where that is or what the to, what the link you would use to share it, um, just uh, um, just connect with the office. Um, it will be on our YouTube channel, um, and so you can find it there. I know John's very gifted at finding that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, but others uh, know that we'll have this as a resource for us going forward. And um, uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, we have a few minutes for some questions. And are there other other uh, things to uh, uh, that you're curious about, or other things that have uh, that you're well, just to respond quickly to John's question is that um, I have this conversation individually with folks all the time and and lots of just kind of exploratory phone calls and conversations because they can get very detailed and specific and everybody's got a different idea of what they want to do. Um, and a lot of hypothetical what ifs. There is no such thing as a question that's too weird. I've heard them all, I think. Um, and whenever I'm surprised, it's kind of a delight. So um, yeah, I would say encourage encourage conversation amongst one another in, and maybe kind of sometimes, uh, you know, having a conversation with me leads you to the next question to the next question, to the next question that hasn't occurred to you yet. So you can certainly call with a prepared list of questions and then we can go from there. And oftentimes it goes uh, even deeper than that. So yeah, Ruth. I just want to. Um, highlight the benefit of talking to Ann or somebody like Ann and then to your family members. When you pass away, your family is going to have to make approximately 8 million decisions. And so whatever, and, and oftentimes people are in shock and they're grieving and then they have to, you have to do a ton of work and decision-making. So every step along the way where your family member knows what the answer is, knows what where the bank account is, knows where the safety deposit box key is, knows what your favorite hymn is. All of these little things add up and really make, allows your family some more space for the grieving work rather than all the details that also have to be attended to. So really it would encourage you to have those conversations and, um, and then tell people where things are if they don't, at my house, we literally have a review every year. Here's where the file is. Here's what it says. And that brings me a ton of comfort um, because I don't know how I'm going to be when my mom passes away, but I know where the file is and I can work through those things that are already laid out. So super helpful process. Also, Anne is one of the best funeral directors I have ever worked with. Um, so I just-, just Oh, you're so kind. But her expertise and her way of working, especially when families have conflict. Um, so what a gift that you offer us, Anne. So I'm really grateful for your presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I would say to piggyback a little bit off of what you said is that the 8 billion decisions, um, some people are really good at working through things by having a project. So what I see is a lot of people get really excited about, you know, making poster boards and pictures and putting together a thing to get ready for the funeral, which is great, but that's a lot easier to do when those bigger questions that required more complex thought and decision making, like finances and, you know, the general plan, are out of the way. Um, you can dedicate your time to, it's it, yeah, people are doers and it helps them kind of work through. But if if they don't even know where to start, it makes it a lot harder. And would would oh, uh, Paul has a question, and then I'll I'll follow yeah. Paul with another thing. Paul, you'll need to unmute yet. This might be a question more for Peter or Ruth. Uh, what is the uh, situation as far as funerals at church? Uh, I know there is conversation going on, uh, or will it be virtual for quite a while yet? Well, what does it look like? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Great, great opportunity to kind of uh, bring you up to speed on on stuff. Um, the the uh, the reality is we are moving uh, quickly towards um, having uh, the opportunity to be gathering in larger groups at the church uh, in the very near future. 
Um, and uh, certainly by summertime, we're the smart team just met earlier this week and we're, we're working up our, our latest uh, set of guidelines and protocols. Um, should somebody pass away in the near future, um, we're still in a place where we could host a, very, a small uh, gathering uh, at the church and then make that available for, for viewership uh, online for others. Um, just as they're doing at the funeral homes that Ann works at, um, uh, smaller crowds can gather there and uh, and then they have live streaming technology that they that they use. We, we could do something similar at the church. Um, we are not um, hosting any sort of hospitality or time for gathering and uh, conversation in the building. Um, it's mostly it would just be for a worship service. Uh, and um, you know, brief, uh, um, briefer time together. Um, later, you know, as as the year wears on here, you'll see that uh, two things will start to relax. One is the amount of people who we can safely gather together, and and then the time that we're spending together. But we don't believe that um, sort of the sort of sit down fellowship opportunities will really in earnest happen until later in the year, if, if not a little while longer than that. So, um, so those larger events. Now, the good news is all of the technology investments we've made as a church will, con will, will continue to enable us for people to connect in remotely. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, Paul, you know, I know Paul, you're wondering about when, when, uh, we might, uh, uh have, uh, another opportunity to gather for, for Nell and re to remember her and to give her, uh, um, uh, to perhaps celebrate her life, um, as a community, cause this community, uh, um, you know, certainly values that connectedness in that way around that topic. And it's sort of, it's sort of a question of how many people would need to physically be together. And so um, right now our limit is 20, but we're going to increase that here shortly. Um, and, um, and it, but we're probably not going to have more than a hundred um, for quite some time yet. And so um, we're going to, uh, we're going to be looking at that very, very carefully. So um, thank you for that question. And, uh, and again, if you want some more, you know, want to explore that more deeply with us, uh, feel free to reach out to Ruth or I, and, and we can, we can definitely help you with that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, are, are there any other questions? Cause, um, I'm, you know, and I, I, I think it is always helpful, um, and to not dance around, uh, how much does stuff cost? Um, <laughs> you know, how expensive is a funeral and obviously yeah. there are lots of things that contribute to the expenses around funerals but just sort of the ballpark figures for some of the basic pieces i think might be interesting for folks who have not had to um who have not encountered a funeral bill before sure sure and and yeah that's that's a good question to ask um there is a, such a broad range and i think what's important to know is that um i as a provider and most of us will say that we will uh, work with you whatever budget you have. We don't want to, we want to be able to give you what you want, but also not to make it affordable. Um, that said, if what you want is a full service with a visitation and a casket, open casket and a service at church and burial and a cemetery and a big monument there, you're going to spend upwards of $15,000. It's a lot. Um, you can, um, you know, and there's lots of variables within that. You don't have to buy the $8,000 mahogany casket. You can buy a pine casket for $2,900 or even a, 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 a even more affordable one. I think our lowest price casket is $750. So there's, I mean, most people come to me not because I'm the cheapest, but because they like a good value. So I'm just going to say that out there. There are lower cost providers than I am. But that said, um, there, there are lots of ways to work with them what you have. Cremation services, where we have a cremation happen first and then have a memorial service with the funeral home staff at church or have something at the funeral home, um, is a range of about 5,500, maybe $8,000 if you have cemetery and food expenses in the middle of that too. Um, 
you can go to um, uh, the lowest cost providers uh, are able to do that because of volume, because they're doing so many. So um, the two companies, uh, Crescent Tide and Cremation Society, actually, I think I have an offering that's probably right in line with what Cremation Society charges, but there's a company called Crescent Tide that will advertise that they'll do cremation for, I think, $750. Um, that's true. There's lots of ways to add on to that too. So they might charge you more if they're coming to your house overnight, or they'll charge more if they have to send two people to the house rather than one. Um, that you might have to wait until they can get there, which might be a, a few hours. You know, they, if you live out state and you call the cremation society, they say, "Well, we'll we'll come after our morning staff comes in at eight o'clock instead of you know right then at three in the morning." So there's lots of, I mean, obviously you give up some of the autonomy and making some of those decisions, the lower, the less you spend, you're more at the mercy of what works for the company. Um, so that said, and then there, you know, we, we serve a lot, a lot, a lot of families that are just have zero resources at all. And so there is a county burial assistance option. Um, and so you have to be, as far as what you have in your assets, you have to have less than what the county would pay us for services. That's the county policy. Um, and so um, if you live in Ramsey County and you get Ramsey County burial assistance, your, your bank account has to show that you have less than $1,500 in your account and that's all you've got. There's, you, you don't own a home, you don't own a car. Um, and so it's really meant for people who really don't have anything at all. Um, but, and there's still an expense to the family. Uh, Ramsey County will uh, let you, uh, let the funeral home ask for up to $830 of the family contribution. It's significantly less, um, and you don't get as much say in what you want to do. You know, you have to, you have to sort of follow by those policies. So you don't get to have a funeral on a weekend, or you don't have to get, have to get it in the evening or after hours, but, but there is a way to make it work. And, um, and, and honestly, I mean, I, to me, the value is the relationship with the person that's taking care of you. And so I'm going to give you that, whether you're coming to me with county funding or if you're spending thousands of dollars, it doesn't matter to me. It's just a matter of walking with you through that, through that time. Um, so, yeah, I think it's good to know, though, that that you could be spending anywhere from five to fifteen thousand uh, dollars or somewhere in between. Um, and and again, there's ways to make all of those things work with different, um, you know, different budgets. <clears throat> and when you purchase um, uh, a um, funeral insurance policy, um, mm -hmm. isn't it true that you're also purchasing a, a, a slate of services and and like you know and and a, a a quality level of casket and things like that? And you're lock you're cut sort of locking in today's prices. Uh, for all of those elements. And so that let's just say you don't pass away for another 10 or 15 years. Um, your, the, um, the value of that, the growth of the value of that policy covers theoretically covers the cost of the increases of those services and, and, and the, and, and the company that you've worked with likely, you know, guarantees that pricing uh, in the future. Yeah. In most cases, yes. So uh, we have decided, and most funeral homes will do it this way, where they will guarantee two sections of the three sections of a funeral contract. So the first two sections, one is a service related thing. That's what we bill for our time and use of our facilities um, for what it costs to to embalm, all those kinds of things. That's in one section. The next section is merchandise. So it's a casket or an urn, uh, a vault, if that's required at a cemetery. Sometimes it's even like the printed materials, the guest book and the cards. Those things are gonna be in those first two sections where, you know, say um, 20 years ago it was 1895 and now it's 3395. You're gonna still, your policy has grown over in value over time. Our costs have risen over time. And generally those kind of stay in line. Say our expenses have increased over the value of your policy, we're going to write off the difference. So that means that um, you're you're paying those prices, those that 1995 or whatever it was, the 20 years ago prices for those two sections. You might also put money in the third section, which is called third party items, which is maybe when um, if you want to set aside money for flowers or for uh, honorarium for your pastor. Um, whatever other expenses you're going to have at church, a good pre-planner is going to 
is going to know what your church is charging for those things. It's going to know what your cemetery is charging for opening and closing the grave. And they'll put in that budget. They'll put in a budget what an obituary costs. Obituaries are always more than what people have planned for. <laughs> those costs have gone up a lot. And so you can set aside a portion of that fund to cover those, those items. Um, that we don't guarantee those costs because they're not ones that we control. So um, if it's well-funded, what I found a lot in this last year is people put aside money for catering for a lunch after the service. And when we haven't been able to do that, it enables them to spend more money on an obituary because there, there's this kind of slush fund for those items there. Um, and so every now, and it, it, it's good to know this is if you're using one, you know, um, I'll have kids come in and say, well, my dad told me it was all paid for and I wasn't going to have to pay for a thing. Well, yes and no. <laughs> These parts that, that we have to do, the non-declinable things are paid for. Anything else that you want to do outside of that might, might cost you some money, but um, generally it's within pretty close, a couple hundred dollars usually. And then the, uh, uh, if, if, if you don't spend the whole policy, the remaining value comes back to the, to correct. Your yeah. Yeah, yeah, the the remaining money goes. The beneficiary of the policy is is the legal term is any funeral home as its interest may appear. So whatever funeral home you bring it to, um, and then whatever's left in the policy goes back to you. Um, if you're in a situation where your loved one has been in long term care and they've received Medicaid um, and subsidized, you know their care is being subsidized by the government, then that money is going to go back to the state actually. So. Um, some people will work really hard to spend every penny in it so that they don't have to return anything to the government. Others will say, you know what? We're grateful for the care they gave us all these years. They, we'll let that money go back to them. But yeah, I, I think that's also a sort of a misunderstood thing is that if you've been receiving Medicaid uh, to help pay for your care, then the money in your funeral policy isn't yours to spend anymore. You yeah. gotta stay within the limits of the plan and then the rest goes back to the state. Um, we, we're, we're at our, the end of our time here. Just, uh, I would note that, um, um, Michael, uh, Stetzler put in the, in the chat that he's done a funeral, um, that cost, uh, just $800. Um, and, uh, and, uh, obviously there are other expenses beyond just the very, very of basic things, but, um, I would imagine Michael would be willing to visit with you if um, if you would like to know more specifically, you know, which services he he uh, engaged to do that. And then if you ever want to just visit with Ann um, about if you have questions or if you're curious or 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 would like her to put you in touch with uh, someone who does sell funeral policies, she doesn't make any money off uh, of, <laughs> of that at all. So uh, she's a real um, she's an interested, disinterested third party. Right. Like so she, <laughs> yeah. she wants you to uh, uh, I'm uh, speaking for her, of course, but uh, w wants you to be taken care of you know, whether um you end up using her company or not. That's, that's not the, the, the primary goal here. And so, and I will um, say I'm, yeah, go ahead. I'm just quickly say that I'm all about um, like a home funeral or, or doing everything to keep expenses low. It just requires a lot of planning ahead of time. And I, so um, I'm very eager to, to have conversation with you about that, not to sell my services or tell you why you need me, but also to just help you understand the things you need to think about to get to the point where you can do it inexpensively. So yeah, I, I'm, always excited to have that conversation. And I know that there was one area that we didn't really cover today, which was the, the options around um, funerals and burials have really expanded dramatically in the last few years. And there is a whole arena around sort of environmental sensitivity, um, thinking about how to do natural burial, just like we talk about natural birth, right? Um, there's also there are natural burials and things. And so we might have an opportunity to explore a little bit more of that uh, down the road um, uh, as well. But um, again, know that Anne's a resource and, uh, and they're um, uh, for you as well. And uh, again, one more plug to check out that, uh, that uh, Life Moments uh, spot on our website. Um, where there's more information about funerals and we'll just we just continue to update that as well but you can always just call the office if you have questions or connect with pastor ruth or myself on uh, the specifics of how to um, work through the funeral planning process with the church involved and and the roles in which we might have so we are grateful 
please, oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. There we go. Uh, please uh, um, join me in thanking this dear person, Ann Christ, for her work today and sharing her knowledge with us. What a gift it is to, uh, I got to work with Ann in her profession yesterday. So now she, uh, the, the quid pro quo was she had to work with me today <laughs> in, in this, in this setting. And so, um, it, it's, I like working with my wife. She's, she's fantastic. And, uh, we're a good team. Yeah. We make a good team. I like to think so. So wonderful to be together with all of you today. Uh, blessings on you. A reminder that six 30 tonight, uh, tune in for the Tanzania auction sort of closing celebration. It's not too late to get your bids uh, in there. And there's lots of wonderful stuff, even if you there's lots of stuff available for not very much money. So uh, even if you've got five or ten dollars burning a hole in your pocket, log in and and uh, and uh, pick up something really delightful uh, uh, and, and help us support uh, these wonderful programs that uh, have been developed with our partners over in, in Tanzania. So. With that, I wish you all the best this day.